Welcome everyone, I'm Terry Bradshaw from University of Vermont. Uh, this is the last of our series of New England winter fruit uh, uh, webinars uh, and ending it on a note that I think is gonna be uh, extremely timely since I've already gotten, even in, in cold Vermont, I just got a text from uh, one of our consultants here who's uh, showed me a few green buds. So things are gonna be moving really fast. I know in lots of places that um, around the region, our folks who are on this call, uh, are already at green tips. So the season has started and it's time to start uh, planning our best pest management and no better person to talk to uh, about that than Dan Olmsted from Cornell Agritech. Uh, we're gonna discuss the latest version. I know in the, when I first wrote this, I said NEWA 2.0, but we're actually on the third iteration. Uh, so pardon me for, for throwing that out there. But first we're gonna have uh, Josh Baker, Mr. Josh Baker from uh, the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture and what's the R stand for? Agricultural Resources? Not sure. Um, it's resources. Okay. Uh, we'll talk a bit about a uh, particular pest that we all need to keep our eyes out for. Yeah, my name is Joshua Bruckner. I'm from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources and the pest we're talking about, what I'm going to talk about very briefly is the spotted lanternfly, as it looks like right here. This is an invasive insect that is primarily found in uh, the Northeast. It was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014 and has since spread to several nearby states, including New York, New Jersey, Virginia. There is no established population in Massachusetts, but it has been found in a couple different municipalities, six different ones. Um, so we know it can get here. And the reason it's a pest of concern is because it has a whole bunch of different host trees and plants, including a lot of different agricultural products. Um, its main host is Tree of Heaven, but in its adult stage, it'll also go after grape vine very readily, as well as apple trees and trees like cherry, peaches, plums, and then a lot of other very common um, forest or landscaping trees like birch, willow. There's basically nothing it doesn't go after, which is why it's so important to know about it. Um, so again, at this point in time, the uh, the eggs are what's, are what's around, and the nymphs are going to be active in late spring, or early summer. And the adults are branch back. They are sap suckers. That's the damage they do. So they go up to the sap on trees and they cause a lot of uh, damage that way, like make the trees and plants weaker. So if you ever find one um, or find something suspicious, a suspicious egg mass or something, what you can do is report it on our website. I'm going to put that in the chat box right here. So our fact sheet is right there, which is very useful. So the top of the of the page there is a link to our reporting form. So if you find something, you should take a picture of it. You should send it into our website. Um, you can also from there download some outreach materials. You can request free out outreach materials such as ID cards, which have photos of the insect. And they also have a link to our reporting form on them. These are great for you to have in your pocket, hand out to coworkers or people that you work with. Um, you can also download and print things such as our, we put this in the chat box as well, our nursery best management practice guide. Um, definitely make use of that fact page. Please, you know, download and print and share any materials that you think are useful. And please make use of that reporting form, share it widely. Make sure you and people you work with, other people in the landscape industry and the fruit industry know how to identify this insect. Um, Definitely very important to know what this looks like and then let us know if you find something because like I said, it's not established in Massachusetts yet. So our goal right now is informing as many people as possible so that we can stop it as soon as we find something, as soon as we find a live insect, we haven't found a live one yet um, and kind of prevent it from becoming as bad as it is in Pennsylvania where it is costing, doing a lot of damage. A lot of vineyards have lost a lot of plants. It's uh, unsightly because it'll swarm in huge numbers when it's present and has caused a lot of economic and environmental damage um, so far in Pennsylvania. So um, right now it's all, all about outreach and awareness. So make sure you share as widely as you can with everyone. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Josh. The uh brochure is in that uh in the in the chat and this really is a, a a bug that we should get to an insect we really need to uh become familiar with it's a it's a gorgeous insect from a entomologist standpoint but definitely something that we should be pretty concerned about if we see it on our farms it, it, um, it is a true bug it's a it's a sap sucker so it's related to things like um aphids and stink bugs 
Hemiptera, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you. And uh, yeah, let's keep our eyes peeled. And I'm sure there's people on this uh, call who already have seen it around their neighborhoods. Um, and uh, yeah, certainly something of, of concern. Uh, all right, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dan Olmsted, uh, who's going to discuss uh, the uh, changes in NEWA and some of the updates we've seen. Dan has been at uh, Cornell for a number of years, of 15 or so, uh, got his master's in entomology in Anthony Shelton's lab, and since 2017 has been the coordinator of NEWA. And I'm not going to go any further into the history of it um, because he may go into that himself. So I'm going to let Dan speak and I'll hop over and keep an eye on the chat. So take it away. Hey, great. Thanks, Terry. Um, that was a great introduction. And before I actually start, I want to seg because Joshua, I, uh, you brought up a great point. I want to mention that um, we're actually working with Penn State University and Virginia and Rutgers on developing an, uh, a rapid response model that we can put on NUA for spotted lanternflies. So we're looking at observational data from the last two years and we're kind of reverse engineering something. I don't think there will be anything ready for public view this season, um, but we're working really hard. And the idea is, um, you know, we, if we solve this sort of workflow uh, for spotted lanternfly, the next thing that's in the pipeline, we don't want this to happen, but we know it probably will. We're going to have a process in place to um, come up with a quick response uh, for you all as growers. You know, it's not the most comprehensive model, but it's like a placeholder until the published peer review research comes out. So I just wanted to mention that really quickly. It seemed like a good opportunity. So uh, let me just minimize a couple of things on my own screen. I'm going to put up this slide first because a lot of you have been asking questions. Where are we at with NUA? Where's the new website? Um, and this is kind of the format I'm going to follow today. And interestingly enough, you're going to see at the very top, even above uh, NUA 3.0 beta, um, I have user support. And I think what's really going to get us through the next year or so as we ease our way from the quote old website, which uh, we'll refer to as NUA 2.0, to the new site, which we'll refer to as NUA 3.0 beta, and I'll explain why I'm saying that. Um, before any of that happens, I encourage all of you uh, write down this URL address at the top because this is a new resource. This provides a baseline of information for every single model. Um, that we are moving over from the old format to the new format. So um, I'm going to play an example later on for Apple Maggot, but I walk you through um, each of these new models and I explain how, where things are, how they work, and so on and so forth, just to give you an idea. The other plug I'm going to put here right in the beginning is that I'm really going to start trying to use social media. I have I admit I am not the best person at this, but I see it at this point as a really uh, potentially useful way to get information out quickly. Um, if I have something urgent to share or I find an interesting article, uh, I, we have a new uh, account on Twitter uh, and we also have a Facebook page now. Um, so I think I have another slide at the end. I'll put these back up, but I'll give you just one more second. Um, to look at all these different web resources uh, that are going to be available moving forward. Okay. Um, so at the very top, I have this idea that, you know, user support is what's going to drive uh, our success moving forward. And part of that is uh, basically, you know, being very forward about what makes NUA possible. Um, you know, we always talk about NUA at Cornell, but NUA is actually a part of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, and um, both NUA and IPM are technically part of Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I want to be sure that we're giving credit where credit is due. Um, so we work with our regional teams, we work with our county agents, and you know, the approach that has been developed over the past 10 years or so is also useful. Uh, among other uh, cooperating states. And, you know, that's why Terry's on board here. And, you know, we work with Penn State and so on and so forth. The other key partner, though, that really uh, is behind the scenes is the Northeast Regional Climate Center. So they're affiliated with NOAA, but they provide all the database management, the systems administration, 
that allow us to present what I'm going to share with you today. Um, their programmer we're working very closely with, uh, like I said, systems administration, and then also their meteorology and climate expertise. Um, obviously, we're part of Cornell CALS, but we also, for this specific web rebuild project, uh, my predecessor uh, colleague and mentor, Juliet Carroll, along with Arte Gaetano, the director at Northeast Regional Climate Center, and our now retired director, uh, Jennifer Grant, uh, received funding to really uh, get this going because there was such a need. You all were saying, well, we really want this sort of functionality. It's got to be easier to use. I need to be able to see this on my little smart screen and I'm pinching and squeezing and I'm losing my eyesight because of it. But just some acknowledgements there. Um, I, you know, I mentioned uh, University of Vermont, Penn State, but it, it gets even broader. And the way NUA works, it's really, uh, no pun intended, it's an organic approach uh, because we do our thing in New York State, uh, but we have really good connections with our neighbors. And uh, way back when, I think maybe it was like 2007, 2008, Vermont was actually, I believe, the first or second state uh, to, to join forces with New York and, the, and Cornell to say, uh, this is really useful uh, for our growers. Growers are asking for this. And from there it has grown. Uh, NUA has never been something where I'm going out to like trade shows and recruiting people and saying, hey, you should join NUA because we have the best thing out there. That's not how it works. We're really a niche. Um, what we do meets the needs of a specific audience. Um, I'm not gonna get into it today, but we have a 2017 survey of all our NUA users. And uh, it's really interesting because the largest group are small to medium sized growers. So 10 to 100 acres. It's not to say we don't work with larger operations as well, but economically speaking, uh, those are the folks, you all out there are the folks who gain the most tangible economic benefits uh, from this. And I love this slide. This is something new I'm doing this year because NUA is not me. I'm just kind of like the person who's controlling the chaos. Uh, because we always have such great ideas and idea uh, resources um, that need to be identified that I really want to emphasize moving forward that the technology driving NUA is just that. It's technology. It's a tool. And it's never, it's not meant to, you know, become AI or like cyborg-like and replace human beings. It's only successful because of everybody you see on this screen. Um, and just very briefly, upper left-hand corner, uh, my friend and colleague and mentor, as I mentioned before, Juliet Carroll, um, put in so much time and energy uh, for us to be able to even have this conversation. There were points in the past when Nua literally faced extinction, and uh, she was the one who pulled it through. And since then, we have built this very broad collaboration. Right now, we're at 16 states. Again, uh, because I'm working with this great team of people, it makes it possible. You know, we're not overextended for this exact fact. So you'll see your own new estate coordinators here, but you'll also see our programmers at NRCC, um, people in the grape industry. Kim Knappenberger is another key person on my team who works part time on the help desk, which I'll talk about, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. This part is really important to me. Um, at least as much, if not more, than the kind of nerdy technical side of things. So to, to just drive home this first point uh, before I get into NUA 3.0 is that, you know, NUA is actually not a website. You might see like, well, yes, it is, because I type in an address and I go to there. And I would argue, well, that's only part of it. That kind of is like the forward-facing uh, representation of our technology, right? But our technology is not successful without all of the really great extension folks who organize this meeting today, for example, or who provide like user input saying, hey, I was just trying to use Fireblight and I'm freaking out because the model went down or something. They're the ones who, you know, provide that type of feedback. The third part, the third part of our trifecta is the research. Everything you see on NUA, all these Apple resources you use whether it's insects, diseases, or even uh, the crop load tools that Dr. Terrence Robinson and Dr. Greg Peck put out on NUA, they all have to work together. Anyone by themselves, there's value there, but they form what I consider to be a synergy. They're more than the sums of their parts. So by the end of this webinar, uh, you should be able to walk away with some really useful information 
Um, so I'm just gonna go through really quickly. I'm gonna give you a welcome to the new 3.0 beta site. I wanna talk a lot about the new help desk. This is a new concept. You might've been hearing about this a little bit. There's an email address, but there's actually more to it. Now that we actually have something to share with you, uh, I, we've been developing a lot more online resources to get you started fast. That's the whole idea here. Um, I'm gonna show you how to access the new NUA models, where we are in development because the beta site is not done. We're still working on it, but uh, a lot of people are just so excited. We uh, are taking this, what I'm calling a soft launch approach. You know, we're not flipping the switch this year. And I'm gonna emphasize that, you know, the old website that you're familiar with and you need right now because we're at Green Tip is gonna be there for 2021. But, you know, if you've got 10 minutes uh, on a Thursday night after you're done with your work and you wanna play around with the new version, that is also available. So that's the whole point. Uh, I'm trying to make this not confusing, but um, I also do not just wanna flip that switch. I personally don't think that was a good idea and our development team agreed with me. So with that, um, you know, when we think about NUA and we think about technology, things happen fast. And I put up this picture here because it perfectly illustrates the type of transition we need to make uh, with the NUA decision support platform. So on the left-hand side, we've got this rotary phone from maybe the 70s uh, or 80s, you know, or, you know, maybe we still have some of those. Maybe there's one out in the barn or something. But uh, as we move forward, especially in the past three or four years, there's a new web technology out there that has allowed us to do some brand new things with NUA that we couldn't do in 2008. Um, and, you know, once you get a chance to look at the old site next to the new site, you're going to really get a sense of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, but when I talk about web technology, I'm actually talking about like certain web uh, programming languages. So how do we configure what you're seeing? We're also talking about data sharing protocols. How does your weather station send information from that basically weatherproof uh, computer sitting in your field uh, to the cloud and then to NUA? Um, and so stuff like that, they're all, there are pieces coming together uh, that make this possible. So if you didn't have a chance, if you didn't uh, happen to glance at Terry's uh, introductory slide there, I have these up as an analog side by side. So uh, right now at nua.cornell.edu, the old site is still there. Nothing has changed. Uh, no worries. The carbohydrate model still works the same as it did last year. The insect models still work the same and so on and so forth. However, we have those, res uh, a fair amount of those resources are now complete on the new website. The new website, and I'm calling it a beta, is dev.nua.cornell.edu. So be sure you write those down. I don't want there to be any confusion. Um, the old, uh, I'll call it stable site, is at nua.cornell.edu. Our new beta site, which basically means I'm just testing this out and people should expect there to be bugs and issues that I'm gonna help report. And again, I'll get into that in a second, is at dev.nua.cornell.edu. And so I have this little uh, uh, character here because uh, with anything, I think we all experience this on a daily, if not hourly basis, uh, that technology is not perfect and we need to work out the kinks in order to, in order to move forward in a productive way. So our new uh, website is no different. Um, like I mentioned before, it's using brand new technologies that we haven't used in the context of something like NUA yet. Um, you're gonna be really excited about the results, but from time to time, you are gonna be like, well, why the heck did that happen? What do I do now? And I do not want you to throw up your arms and say, I give up or say, um, well, why hasn't Dan responded to my email? I sent him an email two weeks ago. Um, the idea is to actually create a number of different ways that you can find information. Um, and again, I'm really emphasizing this because in my four and a half years so far, this is the number one barrier to success moving forward. Um, it might not be the most exciting part, but I think if you invest uh, 15 or 20 minutes up front, looking at the resources that'll be available for NUA 3.0 models, um, you're gonna get started like that. And then you're gonna understand, well, if something really does go wrong, it is truly a bug and I'm gonna help out and I'm gonna send a note 
uh, to the new help desk so that they can catalog it and track it to completion. So uh, three, basically three different ways uh, that I'm gonna talk about getting uh, information and support today. So the first is the NUA help desk. This is distinct from the NUA website. So NUA.Cornell.U is our online uh, decision support platform. Our NUA help desk is actually at NUA.CENDESK or DESK.COM. And I'm gonna demo that in just a moment. But what you'll see at the help desk are these pre-recorded walkthroughs. Um, and so those should provide a baseline for what you need to get started. To give you a brief timeline of how this uh, year should go, uh, actually this week we're working uh, with Cornell administration and uh, the New York State Department of Agri Markets to make a formal public announcement because so many different pieces and so many um, uh, resources have come together from different programs, which is really unusual, both within New York and outside of New York to make NOAA possible. We wanna make sure we get word out to say, look at, we're listening, we're providing this for you. Um, so I'm hoping Friday that formal announcement comes out. Once that happens, that's the point at which those social media channels I uh, pointed out in the first slide I'm really gonna start pushing stuff out there. I wanna kind of keep this uh, to a dull roar until we give our commissioner a chance um, to make that formal announcement because they've really, they, they not only support NUA, but they support our entire program. So hopefully you all understand. Uh, but from April to June in my next slide, I'll give you uh, basically a diagram of, of when remaining pieces are gonna be completed. Uh, within the next three months, we're gonna finish out those remaining portions on the beta site and then through, we're thinking August, um, you all growers, you're really important because you're on the ground and um, I don't want you to hold back if you find a pain point or something that's not working, uh, but growers, uh, our extension collaborators, and even the general public can report bugs and errors to this new help desk uh, that I'm talking about. Then sometime between September uh, of this year and December 31st, we are gonna retire you know, that familiar uh, quote, old site, NUA 2.0. Uh, we're gonna send it into retirement uh, with some sort of party, uh, but we're, we're quite confident that this is the last year that you're gonna see that old interface. It's been a real workhorse, but um, we're ready to move forward into the future. So to just quickly show you where we're at in terms of development, uh, the first thing I did, so along the top, you're gonna see all of the models that are uh, currently available on NUA 2.0. Um, I highlighted all of the ones of interest to this group, so uh, possibly of interest. So Apple, Grape, uh, and actually some berry models um, that Juliet Carroll has been working on uh, and also um, Kara Cox has been working on a, a strawberry diseases model that's actually gonna become available. Those are the ones of interest to you. Um, that first row where it says complete are ones that are available right now. So if you were to go to new a 3.0 beta site, you can start to uh, putz around with those and play with them and look at them. Um, wait until the webinar is over, because again, I'm gonna show you where we get a quick start, um, but that's where we are right now. I think we're just a day or two away from finishing Apple irrigation. There are a few updates coming from Dr. Robinson. Uh, so there might be a few uh, additional tweaks, nothing big, uh, but that'll be available. And then within the next two weeks, we hope to finish a strawberry diseases model um, that a lot of uh, time and effort has gone into developing over the past two years. That is gonna be part of NUA 3.0 in case you're wondering. In April, grape diseases, uh, the city watch fly spec, and then in May, we're actually saving the most complex models for last. So Apple Scab and Fire Blight, um, I completely understand, you know, we're already at that point. Um, but again, this is one of the reasons for not just turning off the switch. Um, we didn't want to move the process along faster than it should be because that's when you start to miss details. And because these are so complex, we just want to be sure that uh, Dr. Cox um, has adequate input and that we're doing this the right way. So I would say for this growing season, rely on that workhorse, NUA 2.0, uh, 
Um, I will send out an announcement when Apple's Cabin Fireblade become available. Um, but my sense at this point is that you'll be looking at those uh, probably in late May or early June, more in historical mode, again, to become familiar with the layout and how they work and you know where are those functions that the old model had, how does that look in the new one? Finally, in June, uh, the, our degree day calculator and a weather data query. These are actually our most popular tools, like more even than the fruit tools, which um, drive primary growth. And it makes sense because we're not just looking at one category, we're looking across everything, fruit and vegetable production, everybody kind of channels into those two. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to move right into, um, you know, getting our feet wet with this new website. So the first thing I want to say uh, is that I, I realize there are some diehard Internet Explorer users out there. But again, we're using new web technologies that have been developed only within the last three or four years. And so I have a list here of uh, compatible browsers that we know work. I have Chrome version 81.0 or newer on top um, because this is the this is the browser and version uh, that we do our internal testing with. So if you don't have a preference, I would suggest Chrome. Um, if you want to use Firefox or Safari, that's fine. It does work. If there are bugs, uh, it's just an extra step to figure out, OK, is this a coding issue or is this a browser issue? Um, and actually, just the, uh, within the past day, I was having a conversation uh, with folks at NRCC. Um, you can use Microsoft Edge. Uh, this is a almost, I would say it's like a brand new browser. It works. Again, we haven't had any really interaction or testing experience with this. So. If you're using Edge and you're having problems, please keep that in mind as uh, if you have to reach out for support. Dan, I'd like to cut in with a question that came, I think is timely, came into the chat here. Uh, sure. Is the new site set up for iOS devices, mobile yes, platforms? Is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, this website uh, is responsive and you're going to see that in a few minutes. Um, it's a website, but if you're on your iPhone, or your Android device, it detects your screen size and you get a customized experience. So it's not trying to crunch everything that's on a desktop version into your mobile version or your mobile experience. It's saying, aha, I'm going to prioritize these certain things and uh, maybe make uh, this feature over here accessible on a mobile experience in a different way. It's still there. It's just maybe in like one of those little hamburger menus or something like that. Um, but yes, so um microsoft ios android um and there's a third one that's not coming to mind but there should be no uh compatibility issues with operating systems really good question okay uh just to sound like a broken record uh there are th this is the, these are the two primary ways you can access the new help desk. And I'm doing this before I show you the website on purpose. Um, I know you're like, oh, I just want to see this, but I want to have this in your mind because uh, really uh, my email becomes a black hole. And it's not that I don't like to hear from people. It's that sometimes I get so much that it just it gets buried. And so things like that, there's a lot of different reasons um, for taking this approach. but. By far the easiest thing to do, you know, if you're if you're out in your orchard and you're trying to use something on your mobile device and you realize, oh, this isn't just, uh, you know, a little bug. This is, or you know, I don't understand what's happening. Send an email to support at nua.zendesk.com, and that automatically generates a ticket. It's got a unique number and it's going to stay open until either I or uh, my colleague Kim Knappenberger. Uh, can get back to you uh, and maybe ask some follow-up questions or things like that. Now that said, you know, if you're in your office in the evening and you're trying to do something, you can go directly to this website. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So bear with me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm just going to pull up my internet browser. Um, and let's see here. So you should all see that now. Um, again, uh, you can ignore this first part here that just gets added on. But just remember this this base URL is going to take you to this page. And what you're going to see is uh, a landing page that can direct you to any of our resources. 
the first thing I want to do is come up here and if you'll see in the right hand corner, there's the submit as request feature. And I'm actually going to uh, hit a bunch of things at once with this, okay? So um, if you have a weather station, you know that we have an onboarding process. Um, if you sent a, an email to that email address, you know that we create a work ticket. This is actually like a one-stop shop. So if you go to nua.zendesk.com and go to submit a request, we have all the different types of requests that you can submit here. So um, what I wanna do is, uh, though in the context of this presentation, is go down to report a website bug or issue, okay? It automatically loads this form. Um, so these, if, if, if you come across a problem, um, we're asking for some key pieces of information. This is all required. So your email address, how can we reach out to you to follow up? Um, a description area. And I've got to say, the more descriptive you can be, the better. Um, don't worry about being overly verbose or, well, maybe that's not important. Put it all in. Like, describe everything in detail because chances are one of those little details are going to give us a clue as to what's going on as we debug new a 3.0 in 2021. Down here, it ties in nicely with that last question. Um, if you are having a problem, uh, you should tell us what type of device you're operating on. And I hopefully I hit all the different iterations of device and operating systems. Um, but if not, you can just select some other device. And then understanding what browser you were using is very important as well, because um, I would say like, Maybe 90% of the functions like are shared, but I mean, they're different brands basically. So each one of those browsers has, it can get a little quirky. You hit the submit button um, up here in the right-hand corner, you're gonna get a confirmation that it was submitted and you should hear back from us, either me directly um, most of the time, or if things are really busy, Kim might drop you a note as well and we'll follow up from there. So that, that is like the first feature of this help desk. So again, nua.zendesk.com. Now, um, we're I'm about to show you the website. And so uh, what I wanna do, the last thing here is basically show you how you can find resources uh, pertaining specifically to a model. So for today, I'm going to actually, I'm gonna play the, the entire quick start tutorial uh, for Apple Maggot because it's the shortest one, but it gives you a really good sense um, of like what kind of our template is for these models. But say you're looking for something else. Um, all right, I've never used Apple Maggot before. I'm coming to the to the help desk. If nothing else, if you want to ignore all these categories down here, start typing Apple Maggot, and if we have that resource it's gonna list it here. All you have to do is click on it and it's gonna take you to this page. This page is never gonna change. Um, the video content might, but the really neat thing about uh, the way we're doing this uh, with our help desk and then with our video hosting platform, which is Vimeo, is that I can update these videos as things change. So in 2021, um, clearly we're gonna move everything to the nua.cornell.edu and we're gonna have worked out all the bugs. I can re-record segments and they're automatically going to update here. So this, this, in my opinion, is like your first line of defense. So um, at this point, you can play the video however you want. I'm going to play it in my uh, PowerPoint presentation just because things inevitably go wrong on uh, webinars. Uh, so just trying to cut that out. But I, I wanted to show you this. So um, We've got that. Uh, if you actually click on one of these categories, I'm gonna show you two here. Um, I'm recommending, and you'll see in my slides, to always start with this because the best experience is gonna be uh, by using a user profile, which is brand new. It's really cool. Uh, but to quickly get up and running, I've got quick start guides for those as well. So make sure you visit getting started with Nua first, right? And then, um, I'll, I'll stick to Apple tools, although I do acknowledge there's probably a uh, diverse fruit audience here. Um, this is where all of our resources for the Apple tools are listed. Now you'll see some of them say coming soon. You can still click on this, um, but what you'll see is I just have that placeholder video. Um, and so again, through the rest of 2021, as we finish things out and you know 
workloads start to lighten up, I'm going to be really going back and filling in the details. But at a bare minimum, you're going to have these quick starts uh, to get you going. We have uh, these different groups of quick start guides. Um, and so I'm going to show you two short, um, two, two of these, which are pretty short. The first is getting started with NUA, um, and then one from Apple Tools. And let's see here. And within this first group, there's actually three. I'm going to show you the third in this series because it gives you the best sense, like, okay, after I've signed up for my account, after I've configured my profile, how do I get around? That's the one I'm gonna show you. But remember, there are these two that come before that. This quick start tutorial provides a brief overview of the NUA user dashboard. So at this point, we've gone over how to create an account. We also, completed a tutorial on how to configure your profile settings. Now I want to give you an orientation to your customized dashboard. So we just completed uh, our selection of other tools. Now click up here on dashboard and you're going to get this new view. Again, I want to remind you that our website is responsive. So if you're on a mobile phone, you can look at all of this information just as easily as you could um, on a full desktop experience. So right at the top, you're gonna see uh, this dashboard header and you're gonna see this drop down. This is gonna show you all of your chosen stations that we just completed. So I have Bridgewater, Connecticut, Buffalo, Geneva, New York, and Sherburn, New York. Everything else you are going to see in this page depends on the on what station is selected. So right now it's Bridgewater, you get this summary. It's gonna tell you when we received the last download. This is in real time, so 12 p.m. at the time of this recording. It tells you who is providing the data. In this particular case, um, the provider is not highlighted, but uh, let's see, let's select Buffalo, New York, and you'll see everything reloads. And uh, National Weather Services highlights. So you can you can go to this external link and learn more about our cooperator. We have latitude, longitude, elevation uh, to provide some context. And then down below, uh, this is this is a really great page because it provides some of the more useful and typical weather information that we're used to. So if you've ever had weather underground or AccuWeather, they give you like a daily summary and an overview of current conditions. That's what this does. So in this panel on the left-hand side, we've got, you know, as of 12 p.m. today, it's 67 degrees, which is actually really warm for March. Uh, it's really great weather here. It's partly clouded with a little bit of rain, perhaps. Um, just gives you a sense of what's going on. On, uh, on this side, though, we start to get into some specific data that is coming from this weather station. So we're not just talking about a regional summary here we're talking about what is happening at that buffalo new york location um it gives you a base 50 degree day value since january 1st a lot of folks like to track that through the season but we also give you relative humidity dew point wind speed um, and things like that and then a summary of yesterday you can edit some features in here and if you want to uh, choose a different base model or an additional base model from base 50, you can select from this drop down list. So um, I think, you know, 8650, if you are doing field crops, is actually really useful. So I, I think some people like to use that to track um, field crop uh, during the season. You can do that. You can change the start date. So, you know, if you're gonna plant, if your planting date is closest to April 1st, you can cho choose that. Uh, but the point really is that you can customize this however you want. Um, with this, there's actually different ways to calculate degree days. Baskerville Eman actually refers to a, just a very precise way to capture heat units on a day where maybe, um, you know, if the minimum temperature is 50, you know, maximum temperature on that day would be 55 and minimum temperature would be 48. Um, but it's really up to you. If you're interested in more information about degree day calculation methods, 
uh, reach out to the, the NUA help desk and we'll send you information. That will be provided at the end of this tutorial. You can also actually choose um, whether or not to display these other things. So I'm interested in wind speed and wind direction. So I'm gonna save this and you'll notice that it updates. So we're always gonna have base 50 degree days since January 1, but now we have this custom degree day accumulation from April 1st. And remember, if you access the site from your mobile phone, this is, this is like the most current information you can get because uh, we're combining uh, historical temperature data with what's happening right now. And so you can see wind speed, wind direction. Over here on the right-hand side, we've got a five-day weather forecast. This is generated by the National Weather Service. We use the latitude and longitude of the station of interest to generate this. Uh, so you can, you can be confident uh, in what we're presenting here. Down here, we have some other features. Uh, the degree day calculator is a weather tool uh, that will be or is currently available depending on when you're looking at this tutorial from up here in the weather tool section or uh, from choosing it in your profile. Then we also have the regional radar uh, and some other features. Now at the bottom, this is where uh, when you selected other tools in profile configuration, you get the listing of external links. So we chose National Weather Service Doppler. This will take you to an external site and I'm not gonna do it here in the interest of time, but this is where all of your other customizations occur. Down at the bottom, we just have a disclaimer. You don't have to read this whole thing, but uh, when you when you watch the tutorial during sign up, we just, we. We try to be very clear that, you know, these are uh, basically weatherproof computers out in a field that are exposed to all the elements. And so always understand that NUA is doing the best job it can to provide up-to-date information that's reliable and accurate, but you should always be uh, ground truthing before you make an application or make, take any sort of significant management steps um, to do so. We're always gonna do our best to be as accurate as possible, um, but really everybody's working together on this effort uh, to, to provide information to our growers and our end users uh, in um, a collaborative spirit. And finally, at the bottom, we've got some other additional resources if you're interested, depending on where you are located, again, um, the site tries to customize your experience. So I'm in New York state, so Cornell is displaying, but if I were to select um, Bridgewater, Connecticut, or if I was physically located in the state of Connecticut, we try to, um, again, make it a regional experience. This isn't all about Cornell or New York state necessarily. NUA works because everybody's working together. So you can see Yukon shows up and uh, if you start watching some of our model tutorials, you'll know that there are certain regionally based uh, additional information resources. So with that, you should be set to go. Uh, the, next, the next logical step is to begin understanding some of our models. And again, you're gonna go to profile and NUA tools to select whatever you want. So yeah, we'll just, uh, select a few here to demonstrate you close that and everything should automatically update and now your models are down here so good luck if you have any questions uh, send an email to the address that will display in just a few moments all right so that gives you an idea or a sense of how these quick start guys are uh set up if anybody's got a quick question we'll certainly entertain it I've got one that just popped in. Yeah. Um, new NIWA user, would you recommend using both 2.0 and 3.0 during this transition year? Oh, that is a really good, oh my gosh, that's a tough question. Um, I would say, so Apple Scab Fire Blight, absolutely use the old website. So just go to nua.cornell.edu. If you've used things like the Apple insect models for a long time and you kind of have that sense um well actually the question was new new users um in that case i would say just start with the new one 
um, because it's probably not worth investing the time and figuring out the old website, just start from the new. But with Firebyte and Apple Scab uh, and Apple folks, there there might actually be other ones I, I'm not quite as plugged in with, but those are the two really critical ones. And carbohydrate thinning, um, that's a big one. Yep, great. Um, and then one other question that came through and then we'll end the polling. Current weather stations are moved over to the 3.0 automatically, question mark. That's correct. Um, every, every location on the old website is linked to the new website. And actually there are some new um, quality data quality control processes in place behind the scenes uh, that you're not gonna see up front. But um, we had an old system where when you add a station, uh, there was this like concept of a sister station. So if your data, if you lost a data feed from your from your location, um, the programmers would the the meteorologists would choose like uh, the closest fit nearby to fill in those gaps. Uh, NRCC is moving to a gridded uh, data system uh, that they've been developing for a couple of years, and so now uh, the need for a sister station has been eliminated. That's actually going to make it more accurate because I believe it's like a four kilometer grid. So a four by whatever four by four kilometer square your weather station falls in, that's where uh, backup data will come from, whether it's temperature uh, or rainfall. I think those are the two main ones. Great question though. Um, uh, okay. Great. Anything else before we move on? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I can see the results. All right. Question number one, is the old website available for the 2021 growing season? The correct answer is yes. So you go to where you've always gone. Uh, it's, it's just nua.cornell.edu. And for the entire growing season, it will be there. Question number two, how do you access NUA 3.0 for the 2021 growing season? You add dev dot in front of that old address. So it's dev.nua.cornell.edu. And again, I acknowledge it could be a little bit confusing, but we wanted to make this available for at least a season before we just you know, completely switched over. Um, so there is a difference. Um, where can you go to watch the quick start guides for all NUA 3.0 models? The correct answer is nua.zendesk.com. Um, so this is a really good place to um, help emphasize the point that we've got all these different communication channels for getting help now. So it's Z-E-N-D-E-S-K.com. I think at some point in the future, um, we'll make it something, we, we might make it something that has like the Cornell affiliation, but there's so much going on in 2021, it would just be overwhelming. So uh, for at least this year, uh, nua.zendesk.com. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go back for a second here. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, the second this is the second of two that I want to show you. Um, we're going to watch how to use the Apple Maggot model because in terms of user inputs and saved settings and stuff, um, this is uh, probably the quickest to do. So let me get this one started. This quick start tutorial provides a brief overview of the NUA Apple Maggot model. If left unmanaged, Apple Maggot larvae can cause the feeding damage as is shown in this image. If you haven't done so already, complete the quick start tutorials called Create a NUA User Account, Configure your NUA Dashboard, and NUA Dashboard Navigation by clicking the links in the description for this video. Accuracy of weather data is the responsibility of the owners of the weather station instruments. NUA is not responsible for accuracy of the weather data collected by instruments in the network. If you notice erroneous or missing weather data, contact NUA and we will contact the owner of the instrument. In no event shall Cornell University or any weather station be liable to any party for direct, indirect, special, incidental, or consequential damages, including lost profits, arising out of the use of NUA. Let's talk about the Apple Maggot model. The first thing you need to do is make sure that it's activated in your profile settings. So from the dashboard, after you log in, go to Profile, click NUA Tools, click the Apple Tools drop down, and simply make sure that Apple Maggot is selected. 
then you can go back to the dashboard page. Before I move on though, I wanna point out, and this is a really cool feature, our new website is responsive. So if you wanna access it from a mobile phone, an iPad or a tablet device, you can do so, and everything is resizing uh, to fit your screen for a good user experience. So with that, let's continue on with Apple Mega. So scroll to the bottom and this model should be active now. If you click the care icon, you're gonna get a brief summary of current conditions. Um, it's never gonna be historical uh, and you'll understand what I'm talking about in a few moments with the main model that I talk about, but you'll get uh, this message on the left-hand side and then you're gonna see what the current base 50 EE uh, degree day accumulation is uh, again on the current day. Um, I'll explain that degree day model in a moment. So when we go to the main Apple Maggot model page, you'll see that it's split into two parts. This left-hand side we call the model settings panel and the right side uh, we refer to as the model results panel. I'll start with these three elements uh, and walk you through everything. So favorite stations, if you remember when you created your account, you had to configure a profile and choose some favorite locations uh, in configuration. That This list is whatever you chose. So in this case, I have Buffalo, New York, which happens to be an airport location, and we have South Bristol, New York. I'll stick with Buffalo for now, uh, just to get things started. Date of interest, uh, if you've never accessed the Apple Mega model before, uh, starts on the current day, uh, no matter what it is. So at the time of this recording, it's March 10th, 2021, and so that's what we're defaulting to. You can also go back in time though, and for, for this year, we're working very hard on qu data quality assurance and quality control, which is why we only go back to 2019. If you've used NUA for a long time, you'll know that a lot of our locations are actually very rich in historical data. Certainly not gone, it's stored in a database at the Northeast Regional Climate Center, uh, but to get things going and to you know, get us over this hump or transition, we're making the past three years available at this time, so stay tuned. Now, when you go back in time, you'll see that um, in this case, March 10, 2020 is selected, but it's very important to actually click on the date of interest. Our model is suggesting a value, but if you don't actually do the click, nothing is gonna update. And so as I'm doing this, if you look to the right, you can see some numbers changing. Now, the last part of the model settings panel is this show hide area. Um, we have four features in, in the results panel that you can toggle on and off. So station selection map, if I turn this on, you're gonna see uh, this very cool interactive feature. I'll explain it in a second. But we also have results table, results graph, and then a management guide for Apple Maggot. So with, with that, let's come over here and I'll explain what's going on. This first section is a station summary. So whatever station you have selected in, in your favorite stations list, Buffalo, New York, it's gonna provide that name and the state it's also gonna provide an acknowledgement of who is providing these data for you. It's the National Weather Service in this case, and it's hyperlink. So you can click and it'll take you to an external site to learn more about whoever that cooperative may be. Some folks choose not to uh, provide a web page, which is fine. The only difference is you will not see this hyperlink. You'll just see the name of a collaborator, and that's their choice. Um, there's nothing wrong with the site. It's not broken or anything. Now, because we're in historical mode, you're gonna notice that our last download date is October 31st, 2020. That's because um, the model shuts down for the winter on November 1st. So this is the last date and hour that data were received uh, or are presented for 2020. Um, so that's not a typo or anything. That's actually the last data point that we're using um, for considering historical trends and analysis. On the, on the other side here on the right, we have latitude, longitude, elevation, simply for some orientation. Now I wanna turn the map back on just to show you some navigation features. You can zoom out, you can zoom in, you can click and drag. If you're on a mobile phone, uh, the exact method for this dragging varies a bit uh, by device and probably by browser. 
Sometimes you have to use two fingers and drag it across, but there are ways to do it. You just need to uh, maybe Google and do a little bit of research if you're having trouble with that. The other thing I'll point out is if I want to go to another station and I select it, it's automatically going to update and recenter. So I chose South Bristol, which is now in the center of the map. If I zoom out a little bit, you're going to see that there are a lot of options here in the Finger Lakes where I happen to be uh, demoing this. So if I wanted to go to another location, even if it's not on my favorite stations list, I could do so by simply clicking and the entire model is going to update using that method. The only thing I'll caution you about is if you find yourself, say, going to Kinesis Lake North uh, quite often and you find use for it, I would just add it to your favorite stations list by going back to profile, then clicking on favorite stations and adding it that way. Um, because one of the cool features is that whatever you do in here, um, the settings are saved for the next time you go in. And so it just takes full advantage of this new system. So let's go back to Buffalo for the rest of this explanation and we can move from there. This next part is the title is called first trap catch and the way newer models work uh, are by using a biofix. So with Apple maggot biofix is actually first trap catch. So you're putting, um, you're putting out traps in your orchard and you're trying to capture the adults that are flying and that serves as the basis for everything else we recommend in this model. I'm going to start scrolling through the historical data and you can see that things are starting to add up over here. We're at, so on uh, May 28th, we're at 335 degree days in Buffalo, New York. Um, I'll add that this model uses a base 50 BE model. So 50 degrees is the minimum temperature at which this insect can develop. And BE refers to Baskerville Eman, which is simply a really precise way of calculating these heat unit values. So from January 1, 2020 through the current date that we've chosen or the historical date of May 28th, 2020, this is how many degree days have accumulated. So let's keep going and you're going to see something change very soon here. Aha. So what happens between June 18th and June 25th is that the model is saying, okay, we estimate that you're getting close to that first trap catch date based on the number of degree days that have accumulated since January 1. Not saying it probably hasn't happened yet, but if you're on top of your orchard management and you know that you have caught those first uh, insects in your trap, you can go ahead and specify what that date is. And once you do that, um, the Apple maggot model, as long as you're logged in through the profile, which is what I'm showing you, it's going to save that date. Uh, which is really cool. You don't have to remember to reset it anymore. And if you've used our old site, uh, you'll know that that has always been a pain point. I'm going to leave it for now and just let the model calculate stuff for the purposes of this tutorial. But this, this whole functionality right here, saving first trap catch is a big new feature. So keep it in mind. And again, another reason for simply having a list uh, or, or adding stations to your favorite stations list, as opposed to simply clicking them in the model like I was just talking about. So let's click forward again. Let's see what happens on uh, July 2nd. Nothing yet. We keep going. And now on July 16th, uh, the model says, all right, first trap catch should have occurred by now. And you'll notice that this number has reset. So if we go to July 9th, it's 1140 base 50. But if we go to July 16th, it has now reset. And so this is where um, things I'm going to explain down below, this is what they're all based off of. <clears throat> all right. So the next part is the results table. And I just want to go back to July 9th for a second. So from January 1 through whatever that biofix is, first trap catch, the table is going to look like this. So you've got a column for date, you've got a column for daily base 50 BE accumulation. And you've got a third column that shows accumulated base 50 BE accumulation, uh, base 50 degree days. Um, so again, this is, this is how the model tracks and, and knows when to start um, looking at insect development. If you're on the current date, I'll point out very quickly, I'll have to go back to March here. 
If you go back to this date, you're going to see that under the current date and under five day forecasts uh, for each of these records, there's this tag. That means that uh, well, on the current date, at least part of the daily records are, are forecasted data. Um, for future days, all of these numbers, all of these degree day values are based on forecasted temperatures. And so these are going to change each day if you're just looking at current date. So it, it could be 14 when you actually get to March 12th, or it could be something different depending on what the actual temperatures were. In historical mode, that goes away. And let's just go back to uh, July here. And yep, yeah, okay. And so you'll see that those forecast tags are no longer there. We call these last five rows ensuing five days because these are actual recorded values that are being displayed. Um, if you're interested in forecast details, you can click there. The download CSV feature, if I haven't already mentioned it, basically takes whatever's in this table and uh, formats it to an Excel compatible CSV file uh, starting from January 1 of the selected year. So it'll be January 1, 2020 through July 15th, 2020. I'm going to turn this off and tell you about the results graph. So this is basically a visualization of those accumulated de degree days I was just explaining. You can hover over any part of this line and it's going to give you this uh, pop-up box summary of what the accumulated values are. You can also download this if you want it for your own records or if you're giving a presentation or doing a newsletter, click that button and you'll get a PNG file. Now, the last part of this model is the management guide. Again, um, these messages under pest status and pest management sections are linked directly to accumulated degree days from first trap catch. So if we go back in time for a second, uh, and we go to June, you, you can see that these messages are going to change. So I think the big threshold here is between uh, June, the last week of June and the first week of July. If you click, keep clicking through these, you'll see that they change. The other thing that shows up here is this pest stage dropdown. Again, this is linked to degree day accumulation. If what you're observing on the ground does not exactly match what the model is saying. This is another area that you can customize because each one of these pest stages has a unique combination of uh, pest status description and pest management. So let's just say adults and first eggs, uh, you get a different message. Um, and these are all developed by our collaborators. This is probably a good point to say that, you know, this tutorial and others that are available through NUA are only meant to provide the nuts and bolts of how to use these models. Where do I find this function? How does such and such work? When it comes to understanding the biological context, definitely reach out to your local extension agents or your area specialists or even your newest state coordinator because they are the ones who are going to be able to provide uh, that context for you and help interpret and tailor these results to meet your specific needs uh, on your farm or in your orchard. So the last thing I want to show you are these features underneath the model results panel. If you want more info, you can click on that tab. And this is a, 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 a specialized list that we present based on where the station is that you're accessing. So there's a geographic element. For example, uh, you'll see here that we have a lot of Cornell resources listed for Apple Maggot. But if you happen to be in another area, say uh, Michigan, or Ohio, and there are uh, local resources available, you will see those instead of, uh, you know, our New York um, information. So keep that in mind. Always look in more info for context and, and additional information. Acknowledgement simply tells you who helped us develop this model and who provided the expertise. And finally, references. Uh, everything we do in NUA, we try to base on peer-reviewed research or um, extensive extension expertise or uh, by working with researchers who are in the field. Send a message to support at NUA.Zendesk.com if you have any other questions about the model. We will create a unique electronic work ticket, which we will keep open until your issue is resolved.
NUA is possible thanks to collaborations with Cornell Cooperative Extension and the Northeast Regional Climate Center, and through close partnerships with these regional institutions and organizations. Those, the combining both of those quick start guides that I just played for you, um, one with getting started and the other one with Apple Maggot, gives you a really good sense of how NUA 3.0 is laid out. Um, depending on what model you're accessing, there are going to be some differences, but in terms of navigation, whether you're, when you want to like select a location within your profile, um, how to access historical information, um, those things are all the same across the board. Um, some of our insect models get more complex. So like coddling moth or, um, or uh, oriental fruit moth might have multiple biofixes through the season, but it's the same idea. So as the model predicts uh, the approach of each biofix, more things are gonna pop up, but you're already gonna understand how you enter that information. <clears throat> so um, again, I played those to give you an overview. Everything that has been shifted over to NUA 3.0 has one of those quick start guides available. So visit the NUA help desk um, to get those started. Now, I think we have about 20 minutes left and I wanna leave time for questions, but the last thing I'll do is just quickly uh, walk you through some of the other um, non-model elements of, of our new website so that you have an awareness of those resources. Um, so again, if you bear with me, I'm going to go back to my browser and we'll go to the website. So again, dev.nua.cornell.edu. This is the beta version. This is the one we're testing. If you have any problems with this, you're gonna reach out uh, and let us know right away. Don't feel like you have to hesitate. Um, <clears throat> so to just give you a general orientation uh, to the broader website, if, if you're not logged in, if you've never logged in before, you don't have an account and you go to this URL, Think of this as like the equivalent of uh, what our current site does. It's, it, it's kind of like a landing page and it's an advertisement. So it works um, and the same goes for any of our models. You don't have to be logged in to use them, um, but they kind of operate in, a, in like a, an advertising sort of way saying this is what you can do. But the idea is let's get you a profile account so that you can save your settings. You know, we only collect very basic information, your email address and I think your state and like whatever name you put in. Um, we have a really strict data use policy. We don't share it with anyone uh, without your explicit risk written permission. So, you know, all these things come together to try and like um, encourage folks to sign up for an account because that's gonna be the best user experience. But to just give you this high level overview, um, so we're on the landing page. You're gonna see that there's certain functionality that looks similar to that dashboard I showed you in the tutorial. You know, we have this map, it's all interactive. You can do the same things. Um, and then we have, depending on what the person selects, we do have this station drop down here. And so you can, you can select locations uh, either way. Uh, again, in the profile, it's on the left-hand side over here and you're selecting only from your favorite stations. Here, it's just a list of all, gosh, like 700 uh, available stations. So you can see it's a bit more cumbersome. Um, you can click on any location you want over here. Everything automatically updates. That's one of the really neat things. There's no more like submit button. There's no, you don't hit the reload page, anything like that. It's just, it does it. So you select what you want and then you go. Um, over here, you can't customize degree days without the profile. Um, but again, you see some of these basic things. And then down here, again, in the spirit of kind of advertising what this is, if I've never visited the site, um, I'll be updating uh, blogs and articles uh, on this site. Um, I haven't quite finalized the exact workflow yet, but again, for, uh, to get people interested, it's gonna be displaying the four most recent articles. Um, and then down here, we have like this dynamic, dynamic component that shows our regional partners. If we go up to the top, um, if you want to look at a full list of the articles that I post to this page, um, you can see them here. You can filter them by year. 
we don't have all the functionality that our current um, site that's hosted directly under the court, the blogs.cornell.edu um, has. Uh, that was one thing that, you know, to move things forward, uh, we left this as it is. So I'm gonna figure something out there, uh, but stay tuned. Um, but then we have this get help section. So uh, if we quickly go through this, um, you know, we'll be developing an FAQ section. There's a lot of general questions that are we, we see over and over again through the help desk. Uh, we're gonna have a section uh, that addresses those. And again, my idea is to integrate everything. So I don't have to remember to go to all these different places. I can go wherever I want and I'm gonna find the same information. I wanna make this easy. Um, go to about weather stations. Um, this you'll remember, and if you've purchased the weather station, we have an analog page on the old website. Well, where can I get information about um, weather station vendors? Well, we have this here. So if you go to buy a weather station, um, we have links to both of our vendors. And for those of you who are new to NUA um, and you're in a member state, uh, the only upfront cost is purchasing your own equipment. And so we work with Rainwise, uh, who have been longtime partners. And then we also work with onset data logger. So each company representative understands uh, the configuration requirements for NUA and uh, they can work with you to get set up and purchasing and linking to their uh, platform. We have a separate uh, process for taking a final step to linking into NUA, but again, this is what the help desk is for. I don't have to um, try and uh, cram everything in here in the last 10 minutes, just reach out to us and we'll help you anytime. Uh, we want to make this a good experience for you. So um, we've got get help. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, paths here. Uh, there it, we do have history. I'm not going to go into it today because um, there was so much to cover. But if you're interested in learning more, NUA has actually been around since I think 1996 in various forms. Um, so just go here and then look for uh, about us, and uh, you can learn more about that. Um, again, if you're not logged in. Um, or if you are logged in, this is a way to access the same set of tools, but instead of just activating them in your dashboard, you are um, scrolling through them. So this first one, uh, you'll remember, we're still working on weather data query and degree day calculator. Compare data across years, we're actually not going to um, do. It's out of scope for this project. But if we go to crop and IPM tools, you'll see that we here's Apple Maggot. So this is just another way um, to access this. And the point I wanted to make here is that you can use this without logging in. But remember, when it comes to those biofix dates, um, you're not going to you're not going to have the feature of those save settings. So you can you'll just go to login um, if you want to do that. And once you once that's complete, it should take you back um, to the page you were visiting. Uh, so just in the last couple of minutes here, let me scroll through here. Um, I think that cover well. So the last thing I'll mention is that we have these other, other weather tools. And so when you set up your profile, you can add these sorts of links um, to your profile so they're always accessible. So if you're interested in radar, um, you can add a link that will take you to radar for your region based on where your station is located. Um, we're not going to actually display the live radar in your profile because from a user perspective, we decided um, better to link out if you're interested in that. But it's the same sort of thing with all these other resources. You know, if you've ever used climate smart farming, um, we have a link in there. You know, we're not exclusive. Uh, a lot of people work together to make this happen. So you can add a link to climate smart farming uh, if you use any of their their tools. Um, within your dashboard. On the right hand side, we have again, get help. Uh, you're probably sick of hearing that today. Um, but here we have about weather stations. Um, and then that supporting page if you're interested in uh, making a purchase. So I, I think with that, it looks like we're at about 120. That leaves 10 minutes for uh, any questions that are out there. Um, so Terry, I, th I think that's, that's what I have. Great. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, that was excellent. I, there's a lot to cover on NEWA. And, and as I often say, whenever I give any kind of talks, it's really become, uh, well, I go back to 1995 is about when I started in this as an undergrad working for who, my, my boss for the next 20 years or so. 
and we were doing um you know collecting weather data using a piece of human hair on a hydrothermograph and chart recorders and this stuff seemed uh just totally I mean, it wasn't even within my my scope of imagining that this was going to be like ipm up to the minute um uh, and now here we are i mean it's it's dick tracy world and i've got this you know this thing that that i can get it all on and and in real time so um yeah thanks if, if there's any questions uh there must be a few out there yeah while we're waiting i'll just i'll add that you know with the completion of this website it really sets us up i think for the next 10 years because um this stuff is all state of the art but uh I, there's kind of this this idea in in tech and data science where things grow exponentially so 10 years from now what are we going to be doing but by taking this step now we're setting ourselves up to support all of you as growers um and part of that is listening to what your needs are and then looking at what's available and seeing what we can do moving forward so i just wanted to add that yeah great uh so we'll be able to just shop around for any other questions and if if we don't get any coming in we can we can leave this poll open for a little bit and and wrap up um i'm looking forward i know that uh you know i just ordered my copper yesterday and i know i'll be using Niwa for a lot of my planning for how to uh you know make this season happen so uh looking forward to the new site we're, we're glad to be able to do this for everybody. And again, this is a two-way process. If you are having frustrations or pain points, that's why we've pushed the help desk so hard. Um, because my first two years, I experienced the same thing, if I'm completely honest. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. Feel free to reach out anytime. I should also put in a quick plug. Um, we often get growers who are interested in getting a station and i would say for those of you who are interested in getting a station the earliest part of the season is the best so you can make sure you collect as much data although the gridded data or the sister station is as the old sister would have would grab that early season data but if anyone's interested uh, certainly go on to the 2.0 website I, I missed where on the on the 3.0 site you have the list of the coordinators but just talk to your coordinator um, for your state there's one of us in each state and we'll help walk you through the process uh, make sure you buy the right station and then we can help you uh, uh, onboard it. Yep, and I'll I'll add that um, NRCC, so say you purchase a station now, um, to make the models work, they will backfill from January 1 using that gridded data. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're out of luck this season if you buy it. You just use, you know, the first year is always like, you know, a little bit, ah, what am I doing? Um, yeah. But we do get you started. It's not like you're starting on, on March 1st with zero degree days or something like that. Yep. Great. It looks like everybody has voted. We closed the polls. And I'm going to ask this. This would be a good one to end on, I think, because this is one of those pieces that I often highlight. Any any tool is just a tool. You still need, need to know uh, inherently like what your pest complex is and how to manage things. And this is just going to give you some guidance uh, a question came, will Nua give me a heads up to get a spray on? How much of a heads up? A few days, a few hours? Um, and I'll I'll answer part of that. It, this is the way that I use Niwa as a grower. Uh, and then that's separate from how I use it for extension. But during the season, I'm checking it, even if it's a dry season, two, three times a week minimum. Um, by the time we're getting into real critical disease stuff, scab, fire blight, fire blight especially, daily, if not more often. Um, and then it's up to me to decide whether or not it's time to put the spray on. This, this is just one more piece of information that's in the in the toolbox. And it doesn't replace scouting either. Right, that's so critical. I mean, again, I think I said it in one of my slides, this is not intended to replace human beings. This basically, so Terry does work in Vermont, this extends Terry's work. This gives him an extra tool. And for you as a grower, it's a tool in the IPM toolbox. You should like have as many sources of information as possible. This just happens to be a unique combination of peer reviewed research combined with on the ground experience, combined with like this technological support that we here at IPM can provide. So remember that pyramid, those three circles come together to make a really interesting, but um, absolutely imperfect tool. We always try our best, but 
things change and you know you might even be in a microclimate so you really got to pay attention um if you're using even your neighbor's weather station sometimes so and i'll make one plug um only because we saw this when Niwa really started rolling out maybe oh eight years eight or ten years ago in vermont anyway is because when you click on a, an insect model it pre-populates with kind of an expected hatch date or biofix date. I was noted, we were noticing that people were not checking their traps. They weren't setting traps because, you know, NEWA does it for me. And it's always much more accurate if you have an actual biofix. Because so some of those key biofix pests, codling moth, oblique man and leaf roller, just get the traps, get the traps, get them up. And then uh, NEWA will be much more accurate. And as Liz just pointed out, green tip as well, because green tip is also it's a guesstimate based upon, you know, a degree, degree day window. And I think we're already seeing green tip is all over the place in the region right now. Um, so it's always best, especially with something like a scab model that's driven by that particular date, you should have an accurate catch. Yeah. And that, that's an absolutely great point to close out on here because um, if you think for a second about the geographic extent of NUA, we go all the way down to North Carolina. So our insect models are completely useless. In North Carolina, and there's nothing wrong with saying that because they were all developed in upstate New York around Geneva. Um, mm -hmm. So when you look at these models, that's not to say they aren't good, but like what Terry said, they are good when they have that on the ground mm -hmm. information. Like it's okay that, you know, for your particular area, it doesn't give you the right biofix because you can change it. It's all the code and all the thought and the resources that went into allowing that model to change and adapt um, to when your specific first trap catches, that makes it a very powerful platform. Great. Well, I think with that, it seems like we've uh, kind of wrapped up most of the questions and people are starting to drop out. So Dan, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who stuck around for this and for all of the last eight, I think, eight or nine uh, of these various uh, events. And we will be reaching out to folks with kind of a post winter seminar series evaluation in the next week or so. So keep an eye on your emails for that. And Dan, we'll, we'll be talking soon again. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody who came. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right, you too.